Hello. In the year 1524, one of the bloodiest and most tumultuous events in European history broke out in what is now Germany. The Peasants' War looked like it would rip the established social fabric apart. And at its heart was a conflict between a man we've talked about before on The Rest is History, Martin Luther, the man who changed the world, with some of his old followers and disciples who had turned against him and accused him of selling out the established order. So join us in today's episode when we'll be exploring this extraordinary conflict. We'll be looking at people threatening to cook each other alive and feed them to the devil. We'll be looking at Luther's role in the development of European anti-Semitism, a really dark and sad story. And we'll look in the way in which Luther turned into Elvis, eating burgers on the toilet in his, uh, in his mansion. So enjoy. Dr. Liar, Dr. Mockery, the sycophantic scoundrel, the overeducated wretch, the arch wretch, the clever snake, the cunning fox, the rabid fox, the malicious black raven, the arrogant, puffed up, spiteful dragon, a godless mound of flesh, the arch heathen, the arch devil, a crook, a flatterer, an atheist, a pope, a monk. So, Tom, those are just some of the things that uh, people on Twitter have called you. Um, <laughs> Do you think it's me, Dominic? <laughs> you knew that was coming. <laughs> the godless uh, mound of flesh. Um, so, yeah, the monk, though, and all yeah, of that maybe. stuff. Yeah, Overeducated wretch. Listen, um, these are words, Tom, that were used to describe Martin Luther, who we've been talking about on The Rest is History, a man who changed the way that Europeans thought about themselves, their place in the universe, their relationship to God and to each other. Um, and they're all from a pamphlet that was published in November 1524, and it was called A Highly Provoked Defense and Answer to the Spiritless, Soft Living Flesh at Wittenberg, who has most lamentably befouled pitiable Christianity in a perverted way by his theft of Holy Scripture. Punchy title. Very, very um, punchy. So we are in episode five now of this epic series about the life and times of Martin Luther. And we've got up to 1524, which is when this pamphlet is published. So um, to give people a sense, he's uh, hammered his theses to the wall of the church or not, depending on what you believe. He's been summoned to a series of interrogations. He's gone to the Diet of Worms to uh, plead his case before the emperor. He's been declared a heretic. He's been kidnapped and, and stored in this tower where he's murdered a dog. Um, <laughs> and now we're in yeah. 1524. He's a hate figure to the Catholics of Europe. But the man who's written this is not a Catholic, actually. He's a man who thinks that Luther is a backslider and an appeaser he is. of popery. Yeah. So tell us about the guy who's written this. So the guy who's written this is um, he's a guy called Thomas Munzer who is, um, he, he was a follower of Luther. He'd, he'd met with Luther. Um, in 1519, Luther had actually recommended him for a, a job as a, a preacher. And you might think that the two men have a lot in common um, because uh, like Luther, Munzer thinks that um, a, a, a true Christian must be born again. So he, he writes that each person must receive the Holy Spirit in a sevenfold way. Otherwise, he neither hears nor understands the living God. Like Luther, he believes in a division between those who have been born again, a kind of elect, and those Christians who you brilliantly called Chinos, Christians in names only. Very good. Um, and like Luther, as you could see from that, um, the title of that pamphlet, <laughs> where yeah. you know he's describing befouling pitiable christianity so that's been very familiar from our... <laughs> yes <laughs> he he um he he loves he loves to abuse catholics traditional theologians uh so he calls them donkey farts nice di diarrhea makers and uh, he describes them as being scrotum like so... what is it with germans <laughs> in the 16th century <laughs> and their bowels <laughs> I don't what does know. this say about I, their daily experience that they they reach so I, the most you know the most enlightened men, men who spend all their time thinking about the Holy Spirit, reach so readily, Tom, for the scatological comparison. Well, I th I think that, 
I mean, it's something to do with the, the violence of what they're doing, I think. They are kind of tearing down, they're launching attacks on this mighty edifice. And perhaps they just need to kind of rev themselves up. It's a, you know, it's a kind of linguistic dose of Red Bull or something. I don't know. But, but I think that, that it, I think the violence of what they're doing is replicated in the violence of their language. Because Munzer, like Luther, is a man who is ready to take on those in authority. Um, and in 1524, that same year that Munzer has um, launched this attack against Luther, um, an uprising is happening that, that is going to convulse the whole of Germany. So it begins on the 30th of May, 1524, when the tenants of an abbey in the Black Forest, so that's in, in southern Germany, refuse to pay their landlord. And people who listen to our episode on the Peasants' Revolt may remember that similar things were happening and that it precipitated a general uprising because this um, resentment of predatory monasteries and abbeys it was a feature in 14th century England, and it's a feature of 16th century Germany. So just on that, Tom, I suppose Diamond McCulloch in his great book on the Reformation makes the point that that peasants' war, which is which is actually much bigger than anything, than the peasants' revolt, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's much more yeah. convulsive than the peasants' revolt in England. Um, that it, it partly comes out of that thing we were talking about in an earlier episode, which is this extraordinary apocalyptic mood in the early 16th century, and particularly the 1520s. So people are terrified about the Ottomans, that they're going to kind of sweep up through Central Europe and, you know, wipe Christendom from the map. Um, but also, obviously, since Luther's come along, that sense of kind of apocalyptic chaos and flux has become even more intense. So people are questioning everything. And McCulloch in his book says, there's been loads of kind of copycat destructive violence. So this goes back to the comparison that you made in a previous episode with the 2020s, where there have been people smashing up relics and smashing up images. There's a famous example in Riga, also in 1524, where people take this big statue of a witch. Sorry, they don't take a big statue of a witch. Such they a take Protestant. a big statue of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> That's the most Protestant sentence that's ever been yeah. said. Yeah. Um, they, Same difference. They say, well, that's what they say. They say it's a statue of a witch. They throw it in the river. And it doesn't sink. So they then take it out the river and they set it on fire and they burn it. And there's this sort of sense, he calls them the years of carnival. There's this sense of, you know, all bets are off. All the shackles have been Completely. released. Yeah. And yeah. as you said, the, the peasants thing, it's actually quite similar to the peasants revolt because some of the leaders of it are kind of respectable, aspirational people who don't, as you said, don't want to, they're sick of being bossed around by their landlords who are monks or kind of collegiate churches. Um, and those tensions, which are always there, have become supercharged by yeah, the apocalyptic absolutely. atmosphere of the day. But, but Dominic, not only by the apocalyptic atmosphere, also very specifically by Luther's theology, because he is talking about Christian freedom, the idea that every Christian can be free. And of course, that provides a ready battle cry for the rebels. And what is more, his insistence on sola scriptura, the idea that um, nothing is necessary unless it is specifically mentioned in scripture, provides them with all kinds of sanctions for rebelling, say, against serfdom, which is not mentioned right. in the Bible. So they publish a manifesto in the early spring of 1525, and they are, as Luther had done, repeatedly appealing to the Bible as a source of, of legitimacy for what they're doing. So they, and this is the key, the key demand, the demand that serfdom be abolished, as true and just Christians release us in a spirit of joy from our servitude, or else show us from the gospel that we should be serfs. So that's exactly Luther's strategy. And of course, there's nothing in the gospels that says they, they should right. be serfs. And so this inspires this, I mean, it certainly helps to inspire this massive movement because i guess the difference between england is that you have london is the focus so if you move on london then you know that, that's all there is but in germany as we've said it's this patchwork of of different states different cities and so on and so you are having um eruptions of rebellion across the entire fabric of the empire and by the spring of 1525 it has reached saxony and thuringia which of course is you know, Wittenberg, where Luther is based, is in is in Saxony, but it's also where Munzer is based. So he is in um, a town called Mühlhausen, which is in Thuringia, and Munzer. I mean, he's he is all in. 
So right. he he forms his own armed militia, which he he modestly calls the Eternal League of God. That's a great name for a militia. He um, he does what I think what, what I would certainly do um, if I were leading um, a rebellion. Uh, I, I I would arrange for a huge white flag to serve as its banner and put a, a rainbow on it. Oh my word! So that's, so that's, that's very that's very very, uh, very twenty 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 four, yeah. isn't it? it is. um, but but. It, I, it, it also has the very Lutheran slogan on it, may the word of God endure forever. So, um, so Munster has his huge great flag. He's got a rainbow. He's got a tremendous name for his, his, his army. And he, on the, the 11th of May, 1525, he and his troops rendezvous with another great um, squadron of rebels outside a place called Frankenhausen. And there they meet with an army and at the head of that army is the brother of Frederick the Wise, the protector of Luther, but who is a Catholic, Duke George of Saxony. And so this is a confrontation between very radical evangelicals, very radical people who are rejecting the, 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 the Church of Rome and Catholics. And I guess from the point of view of the evangelicals, this is a, a confrontation with the forces of Antichrist that is threatening more violence it's more direct than than even you know luther's confrontation with the emperor at firms and this is the first time right tom that the the emerging splits people would not have used the, these words in that then 1524 between catholics and protestants this is the first time that it's it's become a religious war i mean genuinely a battle and whatnot. yeah a military yeah. confrontation so if we think about luther where does he stand on this he does not approve of, of it at all. And the reason that Munzer is uh, lambasting Luther with all those uh, abusive words and phrases yeah. that you were quoting at the beginning uh, is that he uh, views yeah. Luther as, you know, dragging his feet. A as someone who spiteful not, dragon, Tom. Hasn't, yeah, <laughs> he hasn't gone far enough. And the thing about this, of course, I mean, it's a very, very familiar trend that someone can can take a revolutionary position, a radical position, and then find themselves outflanked by people who are going further and further and further. Uh, so we're very familiar with that today. Um, but Luther, for five years, from the moment where he had nailed the theses to the door at, or, or did he, uh, in Wittenberg, basically up to his return to Wittenberg from the Wartburg, you know, he has been a, a, a kind of lightning rod for rebellion beyond anything that, that Christendom had ever seen. But now the revolution has overtaken him. And essentially, with his return to Wittenberg from the Wartburg, where he'd been kept by Frederick the Wise, he goes from being celebrated um, as a revolutionary to being damned by many of his erstwhile followers as a reactionary. And, and this conflict is really focused on two figures. So, so Munzer is one of them, and we'll come to to the, 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 the re precise relationship between Luther and Munzer and what happens to Munzer later on. But before that, people may remember in our previous episode that um, the guy who is leading the Reformation in Wittenberg while Luther is away in the Wartburg is a guy called Andreas Karlstadt. So he was the guy who was like the, the, the vice chancellor of the university or something. He was and, the and, chancellor. And, and he'd been the chancellor since he was 25. So he's a brilliant, brilliant man. And he'd he's married just not a, quite as, a four-year-old or nun. something. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, not quite. But yes, so he has pushed things to the extreme and Luther is appalled. Yeah. And uh, Luther is appalled by this, I think, for kind of personal reasons. You know, it's it's resentment of a man who he'd always seen as his follower. Right. Um, there's anxiety that all the ca the chaos and the rioting that, that Karlstadt's moves to kind of smash up images and all that kind of thing has, um, uh, has precipitated that this will alienate Frederick the uh, Elector of Saxony, who's Luther's great patron, and as Luther sees it, the patron and defender of, of the Reformation it, itself. So Luther is actually, funnily enough, for somebody who's not a politician, he's playing the sensible, pragmatic yeah. practitioner of politics, saying, listen, we can't afford to alienate our powerful he patron. Right. He does not want to defund the police, I right. think would be the way of saying you know, He recognises right. that you need someone to... To back you up to maintain yeah. law and order and inevitably also there are big theological arguments and the biggest one is um around transubstantiation luther argues that 
Christ is literally in the bread and wine at, given at the Eucharist. Um, and uh, and Karl Schlatt argues that it isn't. And, you know, people may think, well, this, I mean, why are they arguing about whether something can change into something else? But I mean, you just have to look at, you know, yeah. is a trans woman a woman? I mean, these are debates that yeah. are massively polarizing. People uh, get terribly angry and upset about I mean, it on both sides. We use almost exactly the same metaphors, the same language, the same and the same degree of uh, intensity to the debate, don't we? Um, as the people, I, would I mean, I would, I, I think, I mean, I think there are kind of intriguing parallels there. But, but of course, the debate here is about the very, you know, the destiny of your mortal soul. So, in a sense, the stakes are, are quantitatively higher. higher. Yeah. yeah, quantitatively higher. So when Luther comes back to Wittenberg from from the Wartburg, he, I mean, he's determined to smash this upstart rebellion. So he, you, you know, we, as we have <laughs> explored throughout this series, I mean, he's brilliant at invective. Mm. So he, he targets Karlstadt personally, who had been one of his closest friends and supporters. So he, Luther says of Karlstadt, he is a treacherous secret devil who sneaks around in corners until he has done his damage and spread his poison. Inevitably, there is um, excrement-based abuse. So he accused Karlstadt of flinging excrement around. And and Karlstadt, understandably, is feels humiliated, but also, you know, very angry. And so... Did he think Luther was going to back him up? Did he... Is he surprised he by this? Yes, right. because, because Luther initially had said, yeah, I, I, brilliant, go for it. Right. And then had had swung against him when he he, he realised it had gone too far. So Karlstadt basically gives up university life. He feels that it's um, his calling is no longer to be a, a scholar. Yeah. So a he gives up his activist and practitioner of kindness. Well, so, it's, so he gives up all his <laughs> doctoral titles. Oh, God. And Lu Lu Luther then <laughs> continues to misclass him, I guess you could say, by very ostentatiously calling him Dr. Karlstadt, which well, he, he calls does for himself, the rest of his life. He calls himself Brother Andreas. <laughs> I mean, this is so... Yeah, it's it's, it's unbelievable how current it feels. Isn't right, it? and uh, you know, and that's that. Those parallels are not tendentious because the the ideals and the impulses that are being born in this period are absolutely what feed through into the universities of Protestant Britain <laughs> and America as they were. Right. So, yeah. So in uh, by 1523, Karl Schott has had enough of of Wittenberg and Luther. So he takes up a post as a humble village priest in a, um, a, a town in Thuringia, about 100 miles southwest of Wittenberg. And here, it, it's a place called Olamunde. He institutes the reforms that Luther had, had wanted. Had, had, and here he institutes the reforms that Luther had abolished in Wittenberg. So Eucharist is given, you know, there's no uh, physical presence of Christ in it, no images, no music. So this is something Karlstadt is very big on. No music. Uh, no no infant baptism. Yeah, so so Luther loves music. Luther is a great hymn writer. Mm. His hymns are, you know, are, are key ways in which he spreads the Reformation. Karlstadt see, sees this as as um, Babylonian practices. Can't <laughs> right. have that. And Luther continues to persecute him. So he, amazingly, considering all the battle against censorship that Luther had had been involved in, he tries to get Karlstadt censored. Um, and Karlstadt had been the second most published reformer after Luther. So it's a big deal. Um, however, Karlstadt can still be published in Switzerland because right. that's outside the, the the power of... But, you know, I mean, essentially Luther is invoking the power of the emperor to stop his his erstwhile lieutenant from being published. It's, it's, I mean, just, it's, it's just unbelievable. I can't get over the parallels. Um, you know, we're not actually practicing cancel culture. We're the victims <laughs> of cancel culture. Yes. I mean, this is basically yes. what Luther and Karlstadt are saying to each other, right? Absolutely. And um, Luther just plays very, very hard and very, very dirty in the way that people embroiled in today's culture wars do. But mm -hmm. um, I mean, Luther has the advantage that he has an elector, an imperial elector on his side. So he is able to persuade Frederick to banish Karlstadt from Saxony altogether. And poor Karlstadt, I mean, you know, he's his wife has, has, has just given birth. He's kind of wandering around with this newborn baby. I mean, kind of absolutely terrible time. But I guess rather like St. Francis, perhaps, or earlier um, Catholic saints, he discovers God's purpose in his poverty. And he comes to identify the Reformation with um, a reaction not just against the Pope, 
but against the the feudal order, against those who who are rich. Um, and he he repents of his own role. Again, this is very familiar. He repents of his own role in exploitation in frameworks of oppression. So he says, I have eaten from the labors of the poor while giving them nothing in return in his role as chancellor of the university and, and, and as someone who had been able to, to get tithes from the poor. And so he starts wearing, uh, he casts away all his fine robes. He starts wearing the gray of a peasant. Uh, he, he, he starts saying, I wish I'd been born a peasant. And he briefly lives as one, he becomes a farmer. And Luther finds this hilarious right. and, and, and kind of mocks him viciously. It rather in the way yeah. that people have mocked, you know, academics who pretend to be Native Americans yeah, or, totally. or black people or whatever yeah. in America, white people doing that. So Luther says of Karlstadt, he's opted for humility and civility, behavior which God does not remotely command, and all because he wants to be seen and praised and is an exceptional kind of Christian. And I think that that idea that you you get closer to God by casting aside your privilege and becoming an ally. Yeah. You know, this is where, this is the wellsprings of all that. It's, it's just and, uncanny. And, 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 and people today may not define themselves as Protestants, may not be doing it in the framework of a kind of understanding of God, but the, 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 the sociological and cultural DNA it, it's is unbelievable, still absolutely Tom. there. I mean, you're literally talking about a man who's, given up his university, who is in a high status, respectable, very incredibly respectable job, has given up his university degrees, said, I'm going to devote myself to full-time activism. Yeah. And live like- I'm going a, to become an ally. An ally with the poor and dress like that. And, and then his old mate is basically writing editorials for the Daily Express saying, <laughs> yeah. look at this well, hypocrite, so, look at this terrible yeah. man. <laughs> like, because, because Luther, by this point, of course, uh, yeah. has given up his cassock and has- <laughs> started developing a real taste for fine robes right so <laughs> brilliant so they the, so the two men do meet up again so they meet there's a famous meeting between them in in a pub called the black bear inn in jena right. so um karlstadt is there in his peasant gray and luther turns up <laughs> you know swanking around in his robes right. um and they have a big debate um which is kind of inconclusive and 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 then during the peasants uh, war karlstadt is in real danger from both sides because the the um, the nobility obviously view him as a traitor. The peasants are suspicious of him as someone from an up, you know, a, a well educated background, and so he ends up amazingly taking refuge with Luther, uh, and Luther takes him in, but predictably does not squander the opportunity to completely humiliate him. So he makes Karlstadt write a full recantation of his views on the on the Eucharist well, in exchange for his dinner or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, for shelter. Yeah, you know, to keep him safe. Um, and um, Luther persuades Frederick to revoke the order of banishment that Luther himself had encouraged Frederick initially to issue, but demands that Karlstadt live outside Wittenberg, which in turn means that Karlstadt doesn't have any kind of means of of, of sustenance. So he has to live as a farmer again. He occasionally works as a, a, as a, a peddler, and he's not allowed either to publish or to preach. And in the end, he has enough of this. 1529, he leaves Wittenberg. He, he goes to Switzerland where there is a kind of, there is, um, the Reformation is fully ablaze, taking paths that actually, you know, they're far distant from Luther and his influence. Um, and although he seems, and, and in Switzerland, he seems a marginal and broken figure. Um, and he dies in, uh, in 1541 of the plague. And there is much gloating about this in Lutheran circles. And they tell a terrible story that a, a strange, tall, thin man had appeared to Karlstadt's son three days before saying that, that he was the devil and he was coming to get Karlstadt. And sure enough, three days later, this tall, thin man is seen leading Karlstadt away. I'm sure um, that definitely By happened. the hand. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you might think, you know, he's a broken marginal figure who most people haven't heard of. Mm -hmm. Does he really matter? But okay. I think for the reasons that we've been discussing, he does, because I think he uh, establishes trends that are with us to this day. And we may not be aware where they come from, but at least in part, it's coming from, you know, this nexus between Luther and Karlstadt. So Karlstadt had always admired Luther. So he'd, he'd, 
and I think that this is why he goes back to him in the peasant's war. He's like a kind of moth being drawn to the flame. But he is willing to follow the implications of Luther's Reformation to extremes that Luther himself does not want to go. He doesn't want to go there. And the key thing, I think, for the development of the Netherlands, uh, Britain, and America is that Karlstadt is a big influence on the Swiss Reformation that via Calvin and so on will influence all of those um, Protestant powers uh, right the way into the into, into the modern day. And the key thing that, that Karlstadt argues, which Luther rejects, is the idea that God's law matters more than earthly law and that therefore Christians have a duty to rebel against earthly lords who do not acknowledge that and to repudiate laws that seem to repudiate the law of God. So Karlstadt writes, where Christians rule, there they should consider no government, but rather freely on their own, hew down and throw down what is contrary to God. So Karlstadt is more similar to, let's say, um, what a, a Muslim theologian of the same period, an Islamic theologian of the 16th century would have said, which is, why would you distinguish between the world of the state and the world of the spirit, as it were? I mean, obviously, if you believe a religion then you think it should influence everything and you shouldn't sort of erect an artificial boundary between the religious and, and the secular. Well, the, the difference between, um, between Latin Christendom and the world of Islam is that Latin Christendom has this concept of there being rival dimensions of yeah. what will become religion and the secular. And the process by which religion and the secular come to be enshrined is absolutely influenced by this period so and luther again plays a key role in it so luther is forced by karl Schlatt's arguments to kind of try and refine and work out exactly what he thinks and so he says that there is christian freedom but it exists purely in the spiritual dimension so in in the dimension of what is coming to be called religion so against the backdrop of the peasants war he says that there are two kingdoms one the kingdom of god the other the kingdom of the world and this really is where our notion of, of religion as something that is simultaneously private and personal to an individual, and secondly, something that you choose. So I think, I, I mean, most, that is kind of hardwired into the meaning of religion in English. You say, what religion are you? It's, you know, what, what kind of confessional group do you belong to? And what do you personally believe? And that is something that had not, that's an understanding of it that had not existed before. And so that's why I think the, 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 the understanding of, of religion in English and, and in the languages of other Protestant European countries, you know, it's a very Protestant understanding and it, it is born from this period. This doesn't mean that Luther admires the princes. I mean, basically he's saying, you know, a Christian is, ha, has freedom in his soul. It doesn't therefore matter what... Um, what the secular powers are doing. I mean, he despises princes. You know, he says that they're, they're, that they're generally the biggest fools or the worst scoundrels on earth. But he says, frogs need storks. So, Right, but that is something that would uh, maybe, that a lot of people even listening to this right now in the 2020s would object to. They would say, no, if you believe in something, you must change, you should change the world. I mean, you know, schools tell their kids go and change the world you know make sure if you believe in a cause then you don't just say well the world is as it is you know secular rulers are as they are right but again people will say um religion shouldn't interfere uh you know what you know muslims shouldn't uh, try and impose their beliefs on society as a whole yeah. that they should treat it as something private or indeed christians in, church in, and state in, should be separate church and state should be separate and this is a very, you know, this is, it has very, very deep roots in the entire history of Latin Christendom, but it's one that is sharpened and refined, say, in Britain or America or, you know, it, by the kind of English speaking world by this process. Um, but I think that this is less clear to, to us in the English speaking world because, of course, we do not get it directly from Luther. So Luther, Luther's arguments obviously has a huge appeal for a lot of princes, say, in Germany. So the idea that um, essentially you can kick out the Pope and as a prince take responsibility for the whole fabric of the place that you're ruling obviously has great appeal. 
particularly for princes in Germany. So um, the most significant of these is uh, the ruler of Hesse, Philip, who um, he'd met and, and been inspired by Luther at Worms and had been fully converted by Melanchthon in, in 1525. And over the course of the 1530s, um, Lutheranism starts to, to bed down, particularly in Scandinavia and in the Baltic. And, you know, it remains the kind of the... Uh, the kind of the, the dominant form of Christianity in Scandinavia to this day. But as I said, the Reformation that comes to, to England and Scotland and from there to America comes from Switzerland and is influenced by Karlstadt. And there's this brilliant comment on this by Carlos Ayer in his book, Reformations. When King Charles I of England mounted the scaffold on the 30th of January, 1649, to be beheaded by Puritan revolutionaries, he probably did not know that the spirit of Karlstadt guided his executioner's hand. Right. So that's so. Just on the the Swiss angle. So the Swiss have been having their own kind of parallel reformation, haven't they? In the fifteen twenties, yeah. a guy called Huldrych Zwingli. Um, there's some sort of business with the sausage in, interfering with sausages. <laughs> yeah, yes. they interfere Let's not with get sausages. Into that now. We haven't got time. Um, we... <laughs> and anyway, Switzerland. I guess it happens in Switzerland, like in Germany, in the Holy Roman Empire, because Switzerland is very fragmented all its independent cantons. And so in that world where people are kind of already self-governing, you can see why heretical ideas, ideas of independence, of you know you in personal communion with God, yeah. why they would prosper. Yeah. And of course, in, in Switzerland, central authority is even weaker than in Germany. So the Reformation can go even further. And these are people, so Zurich by 1524, it's banned music in churches. It's banned images. They actually, Which is very Karlstadt. Yeah, they banned the mass yeah. in 1525. And and that's, so Tom, funnily enough, given that we think of the Church of England as a kind of middle way between Catholic and Protestant, but, but the Church of England, for example, Protestantism in England, you're saying is more... Is it's more, more Swiss, informed by it's more, more Swiss, Swiss than, than Lutheran. Lutheran. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And um, it, it's in this period that any any prospect of kind of reconciliation between the Lutheran and let's call them the Swiss forms of Protestantism are rejected, chiefly by Luther. It has to be said, because um, of course this is the great point that you pointed to in the previous episode: <laughs> the fact that actually sc Scripture and the illumination of Scripture is not self evident. And this is the problem. And it opens up all kinds of potential roads that that evangelicals, reformers can go down mm. that Luther thinks is terrible. Yeah. And Karlstadt has gone down one. But of course, the other person who takes a road that Luther does not want to tread is the guy that we began this episode with, Thomas Munzer. And I think we should take a break now okay. and when we come back. Look at what happens to him. Okay, very good. I, I liked Luther, Tom, when he was um, behaving badly when he was becoming more conservative and he was being really horrible to Karlstadt. But then he reminded me of his stupidity on this question of the interpretation of scripture. And um, he's gone down in my estimation once again. Return after the second half to see if Luther can recover, but more excitingly, this extraordinary man, Munzer, and what he gets up to. Ah, but how splendid it is, since the Spirit of God teaches us, and more helps us understand first this passage, then that one. God be praised, revealing to me the real authentic light shining forth. Now, that was an archive recording of Argula von Grumbach, who is a Bavarian noblewoman, and she'd read Luther's translation of the New Testament. And she had, she had, been, she had been awakened, Tom. She enlightened. had been enlightened. Yeah. Um, in the by that the light shining forth. So we entered the first half by talking about um, this apparent contradiction or this slight hole in Luther's argument, <laughs> which is he basically says yeah. it's all in the Bible. You just look in the Bible and everything is absolutely clear. You will receive the enlightenment that you seek. And obviously, lots of his followers think, "Oh, brilliant! We read his translation of the New Testament, and then we will be enlightened." But Tom, by the mid 1520s, there are lots of people, aren't there, who used to be great fans of Martin Luther and now yeah. think, actually, you know, I'm not enlightened at all from his stuff. He's actually yeah. taken a, a terrible wrong turn. Yeah. And they're saying, you know, this is a guy who's preached freedom. Um, so why is he dragging his feet um, over the freedom of uh, peasants? Uh, why shouldn't they be freed from serfdom? You know, he's opposed the Pope. He's opposed the emperor. Why is he not... Um, uh, 
opposing the princes um, and why when you have a rebellion of the poor and the oppressed, is he siding with the rich? And these are questions that uh, Karlstadt, who we talked about in the first half, had been asking. And Luther sees it as, as treachery. But because Karlstadt had been a friend and associate of, of, um, of Luther and had always been slightly intimidated by him, Luther can kind of essentially kind of bully him into silence. But at the same time, he is faced by a, a much more menacing and intractable figure, and indeed an even more radical figure, and that, Dominic, is Thomas Munzer. And you began the episode by uh, reading out the long list of um, insults that he had been directing at Luther, and who in 1524 and 1525, stand, you know, he, he absolutely um, takes the side of the peasants yeah. in a way that, that Luther is not. So his background, He's a youthful admirer of Luther. He'd actually spent time at Wittenberg um, at around the time that, that Luther is posting his, his theses. Um, and this inspires him. And by 1520, very modestly, he is describing himself as he who fights for truth in the world. Oh, he's, he's a be so kind you, person. <laughs> you can, that would absolutely be his hashtag, I think. Um, and he's very also into the idea that you read the Bible and it tells it provides a blueprint for what you should do. So he argues that the early church had held all things in common, so therefore there should be communism. Right. That uh, God had slain idolaters, so he cites the example of the priests of Baal who had been slain by Elijah. Um, therefore, all Catholic priests and monks should be put to the sword. And you talked about um, the apocalyptic mood. Munzer loves the book of Revelation, which describes, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, mm. coming of Christ and all that kind of thing. Um, and um, and so Munzer says, well, this is approaching. Therefore, all earthly authorities must be overthrown. And like Karlstadt, he argues that you can only properly understand scripture if the spirit has come upon you. And Munzer proclaims not only that the spirit has come upon him, but that he is a God appointed prophet and that it is his duty to proclaim to the Christian people the end of days. And so he sums this up in <laughs> kind of, um, well, kind of very cheery tones. The elect must clash with the damned, he writes, and the power of the damned must yield before that of the elect. The time of the harvest is at hand. I have made my sickle sharp. Golly. So, Tom, the sickle, that's a lovely... Uh, link because actually, in the German Democratic Republic in East Germany, in schools, they would really big up Munzer as uh, as a sort of a proto Bolshevik. They would say Munzer is a Marxist avant la lettre. Uh, he's a spokesman for the downtrodden proletariat. All of his stuff really is just he's like a Lenin. You know, he's a well, man. He, he, he's yeah. A, he, he he appears on the banknotes. Yeah, of the, of the East German Republic. Yeah, yeah. Um, and do you think there's any? Uh, you, th you. I'm guessing you're going to say that's a, that they have m misappropriated. No, not, not at all. I, I mean, don't I think, think I think absolutely. No, I think absolutely. That kind of apocalyptic sense that uh, the rich are being cast down and that the poor are being raised up. I mean, I think you know, as you know, I completely think that's Christian. Right. It's just it's been so secularized that uh, all traces of God in the Bible have gone. But yeah. The, it, it, it's clear where it derives from. Um, and in a sense, Luther's horror at it is a kind of foretaste of the horror of people who don't want to be part of a, a, a communist order. Um, and so, again, he's kind of, you know, he's in his reaction, in his reaction, as in his revolutionary qualities, he is the you know, the, the great primal figure yeah. in modern European history. My revolution, but not your revolution. Stop. The Absolutely. revolution, stop yeah. now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so he, very agitated about this. So July 1524, by which point the, the, the Peasants' War is spreading very fast across Germany. He writes a pamphlet, which he calls Letter to the Princes of Saxony Concerning the Rebellious Spirit. And he doesn't name either Karlstadt or Munzer, but he's, you know, he brackets them together and urges the princes to take action against them and against their followers. And this is a very well-timed appeal because at the same time it comes out, um, Frederick the Elector of Saxony, his younger brother, 
an heir presumptive, um, uh, John, he's called, who is a very, very committed admirer of Luther, finds himself um, in the uh, in the place where Munzer has his church. And Munzer comes and, and preaches. And it's fair to say that the, the, the homily he gives, the sermon, is... Um, is kind of ill-advised. Yeah. <laughs> I think it could You've got this guy, Carlos said. Ayer, describes it as one of the most inappropriate <laughs> yeah. and impolitic homilies of all time. Yeah. So uh, Munzer announces to the to the Duke, and, uh, and, and the Duke has his son with him as well, that he's a prophet, um, urges the Duke and his son to slaughter the godless, warns them that if they do not, then God will take their swords from them, um, and inevitably engages in some excrement-based um, uh, ranting. Rejoice, you true friends of God, that the enemies of the cross have beshat their courage into their trousers. What is it with these guys? Yeah. <laughs> What's going on with them? So this doesn't go down well. Um, the, the, the Saxon princes it's expel Munzer from his, his, uh, from his holding. Munzer blames Luther for this, and this is why he is... Um, writing the, uh, the the abusive pamphlet in November in which he calls Luther soft living flesh because by this point um, Luther has really become quite fat. So that very thin and scrawny yeah. monk. Fine dining, now... courtesy of uh, Frederick as <laughs> protector, right? <laughs> yeah, but also Capons, he sends... <laughs> quails. <laughs> yeah, but also it's, it's you know, it's it's an expression of his theology if we're all damned. Yeah, let's then, crack uh, on. No point uh, dieting. On. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm elect. I can eat what I like. Um, and Munzer thinks this is terrible. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Munzer, despite being radical in so many ways, does see Luther's bulk as embodying a kind of moral uh, turpitude. And so he has all these weird, sinister fantasies about slow cooking Luther. What? And, um, he's going to eat serving Luther? It. No, he's going to feed it, serve him to the devil. And oh, says that Luther's right. so fat that it would, you know, you'd have to cook him for hours and hours in an oven. I mean, very, very weird. Luther has become Chris Christie, the uh, <laughs> erstwhile Republican uh, yeah. presidential hopeful. He's 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 certainly bulking out in that way. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's he's saying not only has Luther become fat, but he's become everything that he'd previously hated, that he's become a pope. You know, we, we said that he's become, he calls him a monk, uh, calls him ambassador of the devil. And very, very... Um, painfully for Luther, accuses him of misunderstanding scripture, says that he, he is a man who has made a mockery and an utterly useless babble out of the divine word, which, of course, is the precise opposite of what Luther thinks. And Munzer basically is casting Wittenberg as a kind of parallel of, of Rome. What is it? Two, two cheeks of the same arse? Right. Is the, yeah. It's the phrase. I, I mean, mean, it's so, not the phrase I'd have picked, but that's, we can go with that very, phrase. If very you're like. Munzer friendly. It's very it? Munzer I mean, friendly. I can absolutely yeah. imagine that he would have said yeah. that. And so it's because of this, the fact that um, you have now Rome and Wittenberg, and both of them are Babylon, that this is why he thinks that the, the end times are approaching. And it's, it's why once he's been expelled by the Dukes of Saxony, he goes to Mulhausen and he, he, he kind of says, you, you know, you are the elect. This is why he does his great white flag with his rainbow and recruits his, his um, devout Christians to follow him. And it's a holy war. And how he comes in May 1525 to be marching against the local princes towards the town of Frankenhausen. So, Tom, I was just thinking, how could they have let this get to this crazy situation where this this bloke, you know, ranting and raving, has raised an army? And actually, you said he goes to Mulhausen in 15, February 1525, and there's, there's an obvious reason why it's got to this point, because the emperor in February 1525 is off in Italy fighting a gigantic battle against the French, the Battle of Pavia, where he captures the French king. So the emperor, Charles V, is completely distracted He's off fighting this titanic war um, against the French. And in his backyard, you know, it's just all completely for right. apart. And, and that's why Luther is still alive. I mean, if, if Charles had been undistracted by all his other responsibilities as king of Spain and you know, invading Italy and worrying about the Turks and so on, then he could have launched a campaign, in, invaded Wittenberg, killed Luther, wiped the, the Reformation out. But he doesn't because he has so many distractions. And that means that it's down to the, the local princes to sort it out. And when Munzer hears who is leading the princely armies against him, it confirms him in all his contempt and hatred for the princes as representatives of Antichrist. Because we mentioned how one of the princes is the Catholic 
uh, brother of Frederick, the, the Elector of Saxony. Oh, yeah, George. Georg. George. Yeah. But the other one, Dominic, is Philip of Hesse, oh. who has recently been converted by Philip Melanchthon to, to Lutheranism. Lutheranism. Yeah. So there they are. It's a Catholic and a Lutheran prince facing him. So unsurprisingly, on the eve of the battle, Munzer goes all in, you know, the, his men are angels of light. The enemies are, are, are the devil. He rides around the camp, telling them to trust in God, promising them that the shot of their enemies will have no power to harm them. And Dominic, this does not turn out to be the case. I mean, he's got a big because... army, Tom, 8,000 people or so. Yeah, I mean, this is, not a, this is not a punch up in a back alley kind of thing. But it kind of is because they, the word of God does not really help them because they've only got bill hooks and whatever. Oh, and right. they're yeah. against trained men who have been raised to fight and kill. They, they just get slaughtered. And pretty much uh, all of the people in Frankhausen are, are either slaughtered or taken prisoner. And when some of the women go to the princes after the battle, I mean, calling it a battle is, is excessive, after the massacre, and say, could we, you know, could we have our, our men who are captive back? The princes say, OK, you can, provided that you put to death two of the rebel priests who, uh, who, who we've captured. It's up to it's your responsibility to kill them. And I think it's a measure of the, the kind of the horror and the madness of the times that the women reach for cudgels and, you know, starts smacking the priests, smashing their bones, cracking their skulls. And it is said that they keep smashing and beating them for half an hour after they've died oh until they're just a kind of bloody pulp. Tom, do you want a brilliant fact about the Battle of Frankenhausen? Yeah, I'd love one. Great. So the Battle of Frankenhausen is the subject of the world's largest painting. Is it? And this was commissioned by our old friends, the leaders of East Germany in the late right. 1970s. Uh, it is in Bad Frankenhausen in the Panorama Museum, and it has the very catchy title. So it, it shows the Battle of Frankenhausen, but you know what the? Can you guess what they would call it? Uh, the Germans. rising of the proletariat against the evil capitalists, or something. Pretty good. It's actually called <laughs> the Early Bourgeois Revolution in Germany, Brilliant. and it's this huge. It's, I'll tell you how big it is. It is a hundred. No, it is forty-six feet. By 404 feet. Wow. So it's big. It, it's a bloody big painting. And, and is it kind of like where where's Wally? Can you see where, where Munzer is? Because um, Munzer is found hiding in an attic after the battle. It's got 3,000 um, people. So if it is where's so Wally. So must have Munzer. Yeah, yeah he must, must be there somewhere. Yeah. Go on, sorry. So, so he gets, so, so yeah, so he gets found uh, hiding in an attic. Uh, he gets dragged out. He says he's had nothing to do with it. It's completely innocent. And then oh, they, right. they look they look through his bag and they find basically, I am Thomas Munzer, yeah. you know, all over it. Um, so he gets dragged in front of um, Duke George of Saxony. Um, Munzer is unapologetic. You know, he, he uses the incorrectly respectful uh, form of you to George. Oh, he, um, he, mis he, he, mis he misuse him. He misclasses him again. Yeah. Um, he uh, he justifies the, the the war. He endlessly quoting the Bible, um, and so uh, the Duke puts him to torture. Um, there are stories that he recants his views, but there's no evidence for this whatsoever. Um, he in his public statements after this, he remains completely defiant, and he's handed over to the Count of Mansfeld. And Mansfeld, Dominic, you may remember, is the place where um, Luther had grown up. Um, and the Count of Mansfeld takes uh, Munzer back to Mulhausen, where he had, um, you know, proclaimed his uh, that he was the prophet of the end times. He's beheaded outside its walls, and his head is put on a spike, and his body is put on public display to serve as a warning and a terror. So, just so that thing about serving as a warning and a terror, there are some historians, aren't there, who say that um, effectively Munzer was not as important as we now think. And that Luther and Luther's allies inflated him. They deliberately exaggerated his importance because they wanted to create a bogeyman and to frighten people into away from radicalism and back towards conservatism. In other words, they were doing exactly the same as what people did in 1650s England with, let's say, the ranters, who maybe didn't even exist, and that actually Munzer was a more marginal and bonkers figure. Who M Munzer is definitely a marginal figure. The Peasants' War does not happen because of Munzer. Munzer is piggybacking 
onto the onto the onto the, the the peasants' rebellion. But I think he does matter because he is a foretaste of the radicalism that you're mm-hmm. talking about. So the yeah. you know the, the the belief that you can only understand scripture if you are possessed by the spirit. I mean, this is fundamental to Baptists and Quakers and Anabaptists and all these kind of people who will be emerging from this kind of forging ground. So in terms of the the, the war itself, Munster is not important. But as a kind of um, a portent of what will come, I think he is important. Um, and you're right that Luther does focus on him. Um, and just as Munzer had seen the um, uh, the hand of the devil in the uh, victory of the uh, uh, of the the princes, Luther sees the hand of the devil in the entire conflict. Uh, and it's not just the destruction. So you have you know hundred thousand people slaughtered. I mean terrible bloodletting. It's also that Luther is being blamed for this bloodshed by lots of his enemies. So here is Johann Cochleus, the um, the guy who had uh, argued with him at Verms, and the subject of all those very abusive pictures. Cochleus wrote, there were many peasants slain in the uprising, many fanatics banished, many false prophets hanged, burned, drowned or beheaded, who perhaps would still live as good, obedient Christians had he never written. And I think it's a mark of how unsettling this charge is to Luther, as well as of his complete egocentrism, that that he is he sees the peasants' war as a direct attempt by the devil to destroy him. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about me. <laughs> it, 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 it really is all about Luther. So what so he has so his response to this is is twofold. The first is very personal. The second is much more public. So the first thing he does, Mutzer has been accusing him of being a monk, of being a pope and so on. So he he responds to this in the most provocative way that he can. Uh, so uh, on the 13th of June, 1525, a, a month after the death of, of Mutzer, Luther marries a nun. Uh, and this is a woman called Katharina von Bora, mm. who is 26. So. Okay. How old is he? He's in his early 40s by this point. Okay, so he's done well for himself, but he hasn't completely embarrassed himself. He disgraced himself. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. He hasn't gone the full Leo. Yeah. Um, so he had um he'd actually played a part in helping her to escape from her convent. You know, she'd she'd read him and become an evangelical, wanted to leave the nunnery that she'd been in. Um, and Luther arranges for her to escape um in a wagon carrying barrels of herring. Um and she's she seems great. She's, you know, she's kind of funny, smart. Um, a very good, I mean, good for Luther, I think. Right. Um, and, uh, Luther claimed that he had, um, he'd, he'd married her to please his father, annoy the Pope, amuse the angels and make the devil weep. But he is happy with her. I mean, Mm. he's, he obviously, I mean, he's a massive patriarch. He's, he's in no way a a feminist dad. I think it would be fair to say, but, but they get on well. She gives him, um, six children, she helps to fatten him up even more, right? Um, and Luther's quite, I mean, he's, I think he's quite a fun father. So he has this tremendous, he, he says to his infant son, become a lawyer and I'll hang you. I, I said that to my good son. Good paternal yeah. advice, isn't yeah. it? Uh, never be alone, act foolish and play, drink a lot. It would even be a good idea to commit a sin, but not a gross one. That's how he okay. advises his yeah, children to avoid good advice. depression. Yeah. Have a bit of fun, but don't go too far. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that all of this is is kind of um, an expression of what we were talking about before, how because Luther sees all humans as irredeemably steeped in sin, well, irredeemably, unless God, of course, does choose to redeem them, to, to allow them to be born again. Um, so in a sense, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, you can, you're not, you're not going to get closer to heaven by being a killjoy. Celebrate yeah. all your life. That yeah, seems so a very, Tom... He's gone back up in my estimation because that seems like a very okay. well. I'm sane, enjoying this barometer of your that, approval. That, that seems like a very sane and healthy view. You know, okay. we're all damned, or we're all well, unless God, of course, redeems us. We're all weak and feeble. Don't beat yourself up about having a night on the town. You know, all of that kind of. That, okay. That's basically his attitude, okay. is it? Well, not, not exactly, but I think he thinks that um, certainly when it comes to marrying, you might as well. I mean, you know, you're not going to get any closer to heaven by by not marrying. By, uh, by not marrying. Right. Right. So, so, so that's put Luther in in uh, shown him in a good light, perhaps mm. by your standards. Um, 
But now we come to the um, the more splenetic ways in which Luther responds to the peasants' revolt. So the couple of months before the Battle of Frankenhausen, so when the, the war is at its most vicious in, in Saxony and Thuringia, Luther goes on a tour of Thuringia, kind of preaching um, to uh, all the rebellious peasants, all the rebellious miners, and is very, very unsettled by it. And in May, he, he publishes um, a pamphlet that to this day remains very controversial, um, absolutely ensured that he would not feature on uh, East German banknotes. And this is a pamphlet called Against the Robbing and the Murdering Hordes of Peasants, which is <laughs> yeah. very, yeah. very Daily Telegraph. Very, very, I was just thinking of the Daily Telegraph. I love that. <laughs> So he'd, he'd actually published an earlier pamphlet in which he'd been more ambivalent, um, so kind of basically saying the peasants and, and the princes are both awful, just stop it. But now he goes, he, he gives the rebels both barrels. So he, <laughs> I, I think there is not a devil left in hell, he writes. They have all gone into the peasants. And then he urges in this very, very notorious phrase, stab, smite, slay whoever you can. And that is directed at the princes. And many, many of his admirers are appalled. But Luther never repents it. He, he, he never regrets it. And this is even, I mean, he, he does condemn atrocities against the, uh, against the peasants. So uh, Munzer's wife is raped after the, after the Battle of Frankenhausen. And he, he condemns that very, very firmly. Um, he condemns the the blinding of 60 peasants who supposedly had failed to look at a Lutheran lord in a respectful manner. But despite these atrocities, he continues to feel that uh, divine justice has prevailed. And that is expressive of this inner dread of the devil that has been with him all the way through and of his hatred for the agents of the devil. And a kind of, re you know, we talked about the, the the relish he has for violence in his language. I think there is a relish for violence when it is targeted against people who he sees as the devil's agents. And is this, and Tom, psychologically, just one th quick thing, is this because ultimately Luther is quite conservative? I mean, he's from a fairly yeah, upwardly mobile, respectable background. He doesn't want to, although he, he likes going against the authority of the institutions that he's in, the university, the church, whatever. Ultimately, he doesn't want to see the social order turned upside down. He doesn't want to live well, in I a think, millenarian paradise. I think he is, um, I mean, he's owed everything to the elector, the figure of the elector, Frederick. Uh, and there's no reason why he would regard the overthrow of that of course, regime yeah. as being something that God would want. I think it's different, say, if you are being raised in a Swiss city. Mm. Because as you said, then the scope for envisaging a different social order is much greater. Mm. Um, but I think it's also expressive of a dread that disorder is, got, is the devil's way of trying to overthrow everything that Luther is doing. And I think that's sharpened by probably, I mean, I don't want to over-psychologize it, but the fact that Luther himself has precipitated this great ruction mm. perhaps means that he is, you know, there's a bit of displacement going on. Yeah, And it's certainly that sense that it's often people who resemble him who are the particular targets of his hatred. And actually the most notorious example of this isn't the peasants, but the Jews. And he, and even more notorious than the pamphlet he writes against the peasants is um, a, a pamphlet he writes just three years before his death in 1546. So it comes out in 1543 called On the Jews and Their Lies. Yeah, I and, wonder if we get onto this. Right. So, I mean, we can't talk about Luther and not discuss this because um, we, in, our, in the episode we did on the Nuremberg rallies, we talked about how um, at the 1934 Nuremberg rally, a copy of this pamphlet was on display and the 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 language is terrible mm -hmm. um so you have all his 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 customary cloacal obsessions so he says of the of the jews and you know by this point i think people who've made it this far will recognize 
the authentic Lutheran touch in this. The devil stuffs and squirts the Jews so full that it overflows and swims out of every place. Pure devil's filth, yes, it tastes so good to their hearts and they guzzle it like sows. So that's shocking enough. But I, what's really shocking um, are the things that Luther demands should be done to the Jews. I mean, Luther is writing, of course, before the Holocaust, but even so, when you read the, the pamphlet and you read Luther's demands that the Jews be rounded up, that they all be housed in one place beneath a single roof, that they be put to hard labour, that their their that the Talmud, their scriptures, their synagogues should be burnt, um, and that then, to quote Luther, whatever will not burn should be buried and covered with dirt so that no man will ever again see so much as a stone or cinder of them. I mean, it is yeah. chilling. Yeah, and the chilling. Nazis loved this, right? The Nazis of course. embraced yeah, Luther of course. as one of their own. Of course. Yeah, of course. And I think it's it's doubly disturbing for admirers of Luther both because, um, I mean, this is this is shocking even by the standards of the time. Uh, as with the pe peasants, people who admire Luther are really appalled to read this. They, you know, they kind of think he's really gone too far with this. And the other thing that's disturbing about it is that it's not just a rehashing of anti-Semitism. So basically, what precipitates this is Luther's feeling that it is those who have been granted um, rebirth by God. So. We could probably call them Protestants now without risk of anachronism, because that word is starting to be used by the time Luther writes this pamphlet, um, that they are God's chosen people and that therefore the Jews claiming to be God's chosen people, that it's, you know, it's it's it, it, it's cast by Luther as, as stupidity and folly and arrogance. So. Um, yeah, so. So that idea of being a we are. We have been chosen and they are our antithesis because they rejected yeah. the word. I mean, that you could, if you were being harsh to Luther, you could say, well, doesn't that very clearly anticipate the, the Nazi idea that you talked about when you did that brilliant episode about Nazi ideology, the idea that they have been chosen by nature to be the supermen. They are the enlightened ones. They are the representatives of nobility and the human spirit and all that is best. And the Nazis believe that the Jews were their complete sort of bestial antithesis. That's kind of what Luther is saying right now in a different Not terms, really, not though. really, n not really. I mean, I don't... Okay, Luther he's not talking about nature, he's talking, talking about God, but he yeah, thinks Protestants but, but, but are the elect and that the Jews are the opposite. But that's really important. He's not, he's not condemning the Jews as a race. So that's what the Nazis are doing. Okay. He, he's, he's condemning them as pretenders to the title that belong to as he sees it, God's yeah. elect, which is, is is people like him. So it is theologically based rather than racially based. But, I mean, Tom, I'm sure that's not much comfort to Right. To, but the, to idea, of a, the but, idea of a dichotomy, the idea of this kind of us and them, that the Jews are the supreme villains, which is... They're not the supreme villains. They, so, so he doesn't think they're the supreme villains. Well, you know, they're, they're, they're to be condemned together with, you know, Catholics or okay. whatever. I so mean, they're they, one they, villain they, among many. Yeah, or, or Munzer's followers right. i mean luther Lu, it, it's fair to say that luther is a good hater okay i mean he 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 expresses his his opinions very robustly and so that's what enables him to precipitate the reformation and it it occasionally leads him to shocking extremes i mean he he's not a saint but then against that i suppose theologically speaking Luther never claimed to be a saint. I mean, his whole point is that humanity has fallen. So inevitably he's a sinner. That's that's the whole point of it. Yeah. So that's why I think it's possible to admire Luther's um, courage, his insights, while the fact that he wrote what he wrote about the peasants and wrote what he wrote about the Jews doesn't disqualify the quality of his insights because from Luther's point of view, you know, he's, he's, he's fallen. He is, he's part of humanity. All of humanity is fallen. But that's quite convenient, isn't it, Tom? I'm a bad man, but I'm fallen. I mean, if you were, so if you were well, something- he doesn't, he, does, he doesn't, he doesn't see himself. I mean- He's no worse than anybody else is how he sees it. I mean, Tom- I, I, No, I think, I think he, 
he has struggled with this all his life. It's mm-hmm. not like he is. He, it's it's been easy for him. I mean, he has risked his life mm-hmm. to make this case. Um, but he would say that. I suppose that um, his relationship with God has been this kind of great love affair, but that God is God. He is fallen and human, and so he is capable of sin in a way obviously that god is not i guess would be his perspective if you were summing luther up so so thinking about sort of i mean it's a silly way of doing it debits and credits but luther is obviously an immensely brave man to do what and he's intellectually formidable and he has a charisma because otherwise he wouldn't have inspired all these people against that i suppose you would say he's an unbelievably i mean you use the word egocentrism he's he, he can be very narcissistic i would say you know, thinking that the peasants' war has been sent by the devil to... He takes himself, you know, his estimation of himself is... is he, I mean, it's even higher, Tom, than our estimation of ourselves on the rest is history. Uh, and he's incredibly ungenerous, isn't he? He's an ungenerous man to his opponents. He's a violent... There's a violence to in him. To his enemies, yeah, for sure. There's a violence in him, which is not necessarily there in other people with courage and intellect and all of those things. Would you not agree with that? Yeah, I think I think the um, the strain of violence in his language is is very evident. I mean, against that from the beginning, for instance, he is against the idea that that say heretics should be burned. Mm-hmm. I mean, he never he never actually kills anyone. Right. He doesn't take up arms. Yeah, uh, he writes abusive pamphlets, but you know, if you if you write abusive editorials in newspapers and that's going to send you to hell dominic then uh, don't go there tom don't go there <laughs> let he who is without sin cast yeah, the first that's stone. not a parallel i'm keen to explore um <laughs> yeah listen before we get onto luther's legacy just one quick thing um i know you'll find this absolutely impossible which is why i'm asking you to do it but you said we could use the word protestants and protestantism by this stage so very very briefly why I mean, is the story effectively that by the end of the 1520s, it has just gone too far so that by the end, by the time the authorities think, oh, we let's try and put a lid on this, has that, that ship has sailed? And by so by the time he dies in 1546, Protestantism has now become entrenched in large parts of Germany. It has spread to the Baltic. It spread to Scandinavia. It's obviously the ideas have spread to England through Anne Boleyn and through all these sort of people importing books and things. And is that effectively what's happened? And is Luther happy with that? Yeah. Does he think, great, brilliant, this is what I wanted? Or has, does he I think, think this has gone completely out of control? I think he, uh, I mean, he's very happy that um, there are that there are Lutheran regimes in princely states in Germany and in Scandinavia and the Baltic. Uh, I think he's more conflicted about... Um, the Protestantism of, of, of Switzerland um, and definitely in England. I mean, he, he thinks Henry VIII is mad, um, but I think he'd rather, he'd rather that, that there were, I mean, whatever form Protestantism takes, he'd rather that than, than what had existed before. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And do you think he almost self-radicalized? So his, his, he 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 never goes back and thinks. Well, maybe I was a bit too harsh on the Pope. You know, maybe- no, he never does that. No, and I mean he has self radicalized. The whole, uh, you know, the first five years of the Reformation are essentially are down to Luther self radicalizing, and yeah. we've compared him to Elvis at various points over this. <laughs> I mean, he's he's like you know he's the king. He is kind of setting rock and roll on its path. Then he gets drafted. Then he comes back and he does his. You know, his- <laughs> his films and then he kind of ends up fat eating <laughs> yeah, burgers That's, eating burgers yeah. on the toilet yeah um and so you know most of the most of this series has been very much focused on that kind of central five-year period where he changes the world and there is a sense of him a slight kind of vagus quality to his final decades i mean we've barely discussed them i mean things are still going on but they're less they're less dramatic and he's not at the head of the Reformation by this point. Um, and the world that he it, creates, Tom, um, I mean, in your notes, you've said the woman world will be incalculably different. And you use these three isms, atheism, secularism, individualism. So the idea of thinking for yourself, not being told, you know, that your personal 
truth, yeah. your conscience. Yep. Yeah. Um, atheism because he's thinking. Uh, how does he anticipate be, 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 atheism? Be, because because um, his great argument is that um, sola scriptura. If it's not in the Bible, it, it get rid of it. And so he it 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 expressive of a kind of profound skepticism towards the inheritance of a religious tradition. So he gets rid of all kinds of dogmas uh, from from the medieval church. But the logical implication of that is that well you know why only scripture? Why not get rid of scripture as well? And essentially that is the kind of the end point that Protestant countries can arrive at. And the whole process that gets initiated with Karlstadt and then with Munzer and, and so on, that you overthrow um, traditional expressions of piety um, in the form of icons and so on, that the, these are idols that they have to be toppled, all superstition. Again, um, you get rid of all that, you end up getting rid of everything. Um, the, the the process of reformation, I think, logically ends with atheism, which is why so many prominent atheists and humanists sound so Protestant. Richard they are Dawkins. evangelical. Yeah, yeah. You know, get rid of it, and you'll but you you will gain enlightenment. You know, you will gain the truth. You will feel in your heart that you're a better person. I mean, this is pure Luther, but without God. Um, and secularism, for the reasons that we were talking about earlier, the idea that it 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 refines the idea of what religion is and counterpoints it to something called the secular and again i mean luther would have been appalled by to imagine that he was you know had a role to play in, in the emergence of any of those trends but it doesn't you know doesn't stop him from playing that role yeah and just one last question before we wrap up what has been and i mean i found this one of the most intellectually fascinating subjects that we've ever done on the rest is history to be honest um what if luther had never lived so or what it, or he'd been carried off by smallpox in the 1510s or something. So is there an argument that all of these things, the rise of individualism, the rise of the idea of the secular, um, people challenging the authority of inherited traditions and dogmas, indeed institutions like the Catholic Church, uh, and the fact that people are thinking of this in Switzerland at the same time, for example. Is there an argument, could you be a skeptic and say, listen, Luther is just Luther is actually just surface froth. And the underlying shifts would have happened anyway with the arrival of the printing press and the fragmentation of authority in Central Europe and so on and so forth. Or would you say, no, it needs that he's a genius and he does change history and individuals do matter? I I, I mean, a seeming parallel might be Darwinism. Um, would the theory of evolution have been found without Darwin? Probably it would. But I, th I think actually... The thing about Luther is that it's a personal experience of God. So it's not the kind of the intellectual materials for Darwin to construct his theory are there, uh, which is why Wallace is also you know, coming up with it at the same time. For Luther, it's, it's that individual sense of God that um, you can experience grace in the way that Luther experiences it. And then when he describes it, everyone, loads of, loads of other people across Christendom discover that they can have the same experience too. It's a, and it's that personal experience combined with Luther's exceptional ability to um, promote his, uh, his, his understanding of God's purposes, which of course is dependent on the printing press, absolutely. But to exploit a medium, you need to have the ability to do that. So it's that the, the combination of Luther's uh, personal experience of God and his command of language and um, ability to promote his takes, I think that makes him so decisive. And I think that, you know, you would have had bushfires of heresy blazing out. I mean, they've been happening, you know, forever, but not in the seismic way that that it does in the early 16th century. So I really do think that Luther makes a difference. Okay. Brilliant. Well, after five episodes, I mean, you've got to say that. But, um, but I think <laughs> well, you're right. I think you're absolutely right. I think you made <laughs> well, the case. Well, because the, the Titanic, I think we spent six episodes, didn't we? we? Did. And in the end, we said, oh, it was just an accident. Yeah, it means nothing, <laughs> I think was the conclusion. Yeah, yeah. but, but um, I know this has been rich in meaning, Tom, and in uh, extraordinary colour. I've really enjoyed doing it. And we will see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.